we move to item eight, which is um, the Auckland Council Group and Council Quarterly Performance Reports for the quarter ended 31 December 2023. So it's slightly old, but I uh, welcome Karuna Daya and her team to the table, and um, they'll address us on this. The purpose is to provide a quarterly performance update, and uh, we'll move and discuss this when we've got to the end of it. Thank you very much for your team. Please introduce some Karuna and you're off you go now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, so as the Mayor has just said, this is the regular quarterly performance report to go through the key financials and service performance information through to the end of December. We've got a brief presentation on results from Ross, John, Brian and I. We also have Merla Edmondson, GM Connected Communities and her team to present a few slides around um, our Auckland Library services. And there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, just before I hand over to Ross, I just wanted to mention, um, we, do, we are continuing our program to improve these reports <coughs> and respond to elected member feedback on these where we can. So for this quarter, we've built out our key performance measures summary to include annual comparisons and some additional charts and to outline more clearly where we haven't met targets, why and what we're actually doing about it. Uh, secondly, based on feedback, we have included a capital project summary um, with delivery status, project phase, spend to date and overall RAG statuses. Um, we've also provided exception-based sound bites of a few at-risk or potentially at-risk projects. Um, so just noting these are a selection of special or highlighted projects. It's still a work in progress and is for Auckland Council only at this stage. Um, but we do welcome any feedback on work, on what works and what does not work. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Ross. Okay, thank you. So just um, in terms of the, the group results for the uh, quarter to December, it is a bit old, but it's uh, I guess it's important to go through achieve, you know, some of the key achievements and figures for that quarter. Um, these are some of the projects completed in the December quarter. There's the Myers Pass underpass project, which was completed in mid-December. There's the Henry Atkinson statue in Titarangi with a whole bunch of um, extensive groundworks to support that. Uh, and then there's a bunch of improvements to the Northwest uh, bus services. So um, three new frequent routes added to bring a total of uh, five frequent services to the northwest. Um, so you've got the extra bus services in the operational sense, but you've also got the capital works to provide the bus priority to, to enable um, that to be a, a reliable frequent service. Um, other things across the group, um, a, a range of footpaths footpath, uh, construction projects completed in the Rodney area, uh, supported by the, the Rodney uh, local targeted rate. Um, some, uh, some key pump station works, including the Newland pump station, uh, was completed. Uh, and then you've got Devon Lane and Koei, so you've got the vibrant mural and all weather canopy and all the lighting that goes with it, uh, all completed to, to help uh, brighten up and improve Pukukoi. Um In terms of overall group capital delivery, um, as Nicola just said, uh, delivery for February is around 94% you know, of budget. It was a little bit higher at the December quarter, 96% but not, not a lot of change. Um, it was uh, 58 million less than budget, but a significant increase from the prior year. At that stage, a, a year ago, it was um, around 90% um, of budget. So things have been, have been increasing. We're getting closer to delivering more in line with the budget this financial year than last. Um, there's been some delays with uh, flood, uh, flood remediation projects where in the first half of the financial year, more time spent in the design phase, um, but that will change later in the year as things move from design to the construction phase. Uh, in terms of group operating performance, um, uh, similar to the, uh, the updates Nicola gave for the, for the February month, but as at the, um, as at the end of the December quarter, uh, overall um, there was a 27 million uh, favourable result compared to budgets. Uh, that was largely driven by higher revenue, the things that have been spoken about, higher consenting revenue, higher growth charges, um, a bit of you know, higher um, 
a higher bus patronage, basically a, a, a 33% more uh, patronage than, than 12 months prior. So we've seen some of those things improve. On the flip side, water and wastewater revenue was, was down a little bit and on uh, some lower volumes. So minor movements, but overall uh, ahead of budget. Um, on the cost side of things, just marginally above budget at that December, um, end of the December quarter. Um, staff costs were up a little bit. That was because we had more staff, um, more staff costs being recorded in op uh, for operating expenditure, less of those costs being um, captured as part of the cost of capital projects, as we'd expected in the budget. Um, there were some additional costs in terms of storm and, and flooding, uh, repairs and maintenance, you know, more, more than anticipated in the budget, and there are some timing differences, particularly around grants and sponsorships. Uh, in terms of FTEs, um, as has been discussed, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, there was an increase from the previous quarter, 220 million, with the biggest movement being Auckland Council being that seasonal uh, shift that, uh, that Phil spoke about. Uh, 100 extra FTEs um, added over the summer period, things like lifeguards and, and things that just sort of normally happen over that summer period. We always see the peak in the second quarter and then things change uh, after that. Uh, across the rest of the group, there's a bit of filling of vacancies. Um, uh, so within Auckland Transport and Tataki, they went through some significant structural changes and then now they've moved to filling some of the vacancies. Key areas uh, within transport is the integrated network area, the customer experience and the planning and investment space. Also taking on more graduates. Uh, in Tataki, there has been um, yeah, filling vacancies and taking on people in the security area. Uh, to, to meet safety requirements. Elsewhere across the group, um, there was a, bit less, uh, but a little bit less FTE in port, a little bit more in water care, which includes some um, insourcing in the digital and project management spaces. Uh, now I'll pass across to John to talk about group debt management. Uh, thanks, Ross, and good morning, everybody. Um, so this first slide here. Uh, net debt at the end of December 23 was 11.9 billion. And that was a decrease of 400 million from the start of the financial year. And that's largely due to the proceeds uh, from the 7% sell down of our airport shares. As a result, debt to revenue at the end of December was sitting at 241%, so well within the 290 limit. And without the sale of those airport shares, the debt to revenue would have been around about 257%. Uh, this next slide uh, was a request from Councillor Philippine from the last <coughs> quarterly catch-up. So what this chart shows is the movement in our debt from the beginning of the financial year to the beginning of March. Um, so the, the purple bars there, they show months where the cash inflows exceed cash outflows. And they're the months largely driven by the quarterly rates receipts and also September, where we had the proceeds from the sale of the airport shares. Uh, the pink bars show months where the cash outflows exceed cash inflows. And realise that throughout this period, we are um, continually borrowing to fund the CapEx program uh, as approved by the annual plan. So even in the months where you see cash inflows exceeding cash outflows, obviously during that time we are still spending the capital expenditure program. If you go to the last bar there, um, the, the debt as of the 1st of March at 11.798 billion. So without the sale of airport shares, it would have been about 12.63 uh, billion. And in fact, um, it would have been probably about 20 million higher than that, because obviously if we hadn't sold the shares, we'd have been paying interest on that debt, which would have been about 24 million. And if we hadn't sold the shares, we would have received additional airport dividends during that time of about 4 million. So it'd be about an additional 20 million on top of that. Now this last slide here just shows our projected uh, cost of funds. So the blue bar there shows you what was in our annual plan and the latest forecast as of December is that, uh, that line to the top there. Um, our interest rates have probably peaked. Um, we can't be certain about that. Uh, so that's probably about as bad as you're going to see those interest cost forecasts, and you're likely to see those modestly come down over time. 
And as far as our credit ratings, um, they remain at AA from S&P and AA2 from Moody's, and again, both on stable outlooks. I'll hand over to Brian. Uh, thank you, John Kira Koto. Um, so, Auckland Council is continuing to progress well with its. Uh, oh, let me just turn the slide. No, it's the wrong way. There you go. Uh, continuing to progress well with its capital delivery program, and as John mentioned, we uh, do continuously uh, borrow for that delivery. Uh, so, fiscal works to extend and separate the stormwater uh, from the combined network at, from Potato Street to Great North Road was completed. Fiscal works, and that's part of our water quality improvement <laughs> program. Uh, several Kauri tree uh, track upgrades have been completed, and the tracks have reopened, uh, including to Penninga, Upper Kauri, Long Road, Fence Line, and uh, Chatswood Reserve. Uh, and then finally, to Tamaki Community Recycling Centre in Helensville. A community recycling centre shop opened in October. Uh, so, the end of quarter two uh, for Auckland Council parent, we uh, delivered 223 million in capital investment against a budget of 225, or 99% of budget. Uh, so, so, very much on track. Uh, our Healthy Waters uh, team on track with their capital program, the Clunker Place New Lynn project reached practical completion. And that's uh, involved uh, boring a 550-metre uh, pipeline from Klinka Place to uh, just through underneath and Brico Place uh, through to the Monroe Wetland Reserve. The Sinclair Park water treatment plant uh, also reached practical completion in December, uh, and that project upgraded the treatment plant to comply with uh, water quality uh, standards. The park's community facility space also very busy, uh, continuing to deliver on accelerated renewals. Uh, and as well as their program of sport park development uh, and land acquisition. So this includes the acquisition of uh, 120 Hill Road uh, to expand Auckland Botanic Garden in October last year. Uh, and because of the accelerated program, they are running ahead on uh, budget as of December, uh, but this is balanced by um, a constrained delivery of technology projects while we uh, sort of consider the purpose technology space in that um, uh, at the moment. Uh, revenue of 277 million uh, for quarter two was 42 million uh, above budget, or 18 percent. Uh, this is mainly driven by uh, uh, building consenting inspection revenue, as mentioned before, as well as licensing compliance, and that's particularly in the dog registration and, and food licensing spaces. Uh, direct expenditure was 835 million uh, in Q2, or 14 million uh, above budget, about 1.7 percent, uh, predominantly to support the higher consenting volumes, uh, but also rising contract costs. That's something we're actively managing. There's also continued focus on uh, delivery of uh, storm, emergency storm resilience related repairs and maintenance, and that uh, continues to add costs uh, for us as well. Lastly, there were, were some timing differences between when we paid out grants for the uh, business improvement districts. Um, so all within the financial year, but just slightly ahead of when we had budgeted. Uh, and as reported in the recent uh, Revenue Expenditure Value Committee, um, a further six million in savings were found in quarter two, uh, taking our total savings for the year to 43.7 million. Uh, and savings were found in a variety of areas, so combining regional service functions, standardizing the support for the three local board cluster model, uh, improved fees from food licensing, as well as one-off as well as one -off savings from careful financial management. There's also quite a continued focus on back office efficiencies, uh, naturally, and um, so some examples of, of where we found those in quarter two, uh, negotiating uh, improved and reduced indoor plant contract costs, migration from copper to fiber lines, uh, and reducing those copper lines, uh, and then reducing the number of leased printers, uh, so, uh, we reduced that by 200, or about 32 per cent. And we remain on track to achieve the $50 million uh, savings target that uh, is included in our 23-24 annual budget. Karina. Thanks, Brian. Um, so during quarter two, 26 performance measures were updated, and we met 15. We did not meet 10, and one was substantially achieved. 
um, substantially achieved is um, when target has not been met by a slim margin, plus or minus 2%. So we had good performance for stormwater and emergency management, achieving targets for all their measures. Customer satisfaction in both building and resource consents has stayed sa stable. Um, in regulatory, although our statutory targets were not met, performance has improved from previous years. Um, building and resource consents achieving 82% and 83% respectively. There is also additional recruitment underway. Um, in terms of our customer and community services, we have favourable results in areas such as the number of participants and activities at art facilities, community centres and higher venues. And although below target, some good results in moving in the right direction with our libraries, such as the active library members. Um, and I guess at that point, it seems a good time to hand over to our library services team. So if I can please call Merla, Catherine and Daryl up. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, ko Merla Edmondson Takawungwa. Uh, it's very nice to be here, Mr Mayor and councillors, to present some more detail around the library services that were requested at the last meeting. Um, I'm going to hand over to the team because I'm currently, in the last couple of weeks, seconded um, to support Phil in his uh, work around the refresh for the senior leaders. So, uh, Daryl Solgin uh, is acting uh, Gen General Manager for Connected Communities, and we've got Catherine Leonard, who is... Uh, head of Library and Learning Services, and they will speak to the content. I'm happy to stay if there are any questions that you have of me. Thank you. Morena, Mr Mayor and Councillors. Um, so I'm going to start by commenting on some of our performance indicators and pass to Catherine, who will do a bit of a deeper dive into our digital platforms and some key business improvement initiatives, and then we'll come back to me to expand on a couple of important partnerships and community wellbeing at the end before we're available to answer questions. So um, let's, let's start by acknowledging the awesome introduction from the earlier slide that shows that there are areas of improvement for three of our library's KPIs that didn't meet the target, noting that two were actually close to being met. Um, and by way of explanation rather than excuse, our targets were set in a, in a different COVID world, uh, while many other businesses and organisations adjusted their targets in response to COVID hours were, were set in LTP stone. But we like a challenge. Uh, and like other people-centred sectors like retail and hospitality, libraries have experienced a slower post-COVID recovery than others, though many of those trends are now changing and we look forward to showing you quite a bright picture from Q3 the next time we are with you. And for example, act active members growth reached a new peak of uh, 394,000 people in February, our highest result since October 2020. Uh, and we're setting new LTP measures now in line with customer behaviour that's more recent. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this slide, but there's three KPIs I would like to just draw your attention to here. And the first one is the, is the visits, which is actually physical visits. So these are actual human beings walking into a space. So people are coming into our libraries not just to borrow books, but to learn through programs and alongside skilled staff to connect with others in our spaces and become dig digitally literate so they can participate in the world and develop individual potential. We don't do all the do. Uh, a quarter and growing of our programs are actually delivered by the community for the community. And libraries are about connection and identity and belonging um, they're one of the few remaining places that people are welcomed regardless of their position in society. But that's a big number, 4 million. So we've had 4 million people through the door year to date at the end of Q2. That's just uh, under 1.6% of the target. And to put that into some context for you, because I find it hard to imagine 4 million people in a space, that, that's the equivalent to 160 sold out Warriors games in a, in a six month period. 
The other, um, the other KPI is the one in the bottom right there, the 8 million total issues. And what I just want to mention is that a, a subset of that, which is our digital or our e-issues, while bricks and mortar borrowing, so people physically coming in, is still the preference for the majority of Aucklanders, our digital offer is also a very significant and growing proportion of our borrowing. Um, Auckland outperforms some of the world's largest public libraries, including San Francisco, Chicago, Ontario, and Brooklyn. In, in fact, we're number 22 in the, in the entire world when it comes to um, the, the e-issues. And then finally, up the top, hidden away a little bit in the top left-hand corner up there is the um, customer satisfaction. You know, as I've just mentioned, we see a lot of Aucklanders, a lot more than the Warriors, and 95% um, of our customers are either satisfied or very satisfied, and that's a really positive contribution to Council's reputation and trust and confidence. Okay, I think I'll just skip one, which shows I'm not, maybe I'm not as digital, digitally no, illiterate. Yeah, that is the yeah, one? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, Daryl. Morena Koto, called Catherine Leonard Tokawingai, Head of Library and Learning Services. Um, so just to dive a bit, little deeper into the success of our e-collections and our digital platforms, um, we, as Daryl said, we get a lot of national and international recognition for the success and the importance of these platforms. Um, E-collections and the use of them has not happened by accident. So we started doing a lot of work on our e-content strategy several years ago, well before the pandemic. So when the pandemic did hit, we were very well placed to scale up what we were offering to Aucklanders, and it was a success story at the time. The usage is driven by having the right content, well curated, the range and availability of the content, the access and the technology all right. So there's many factors that come into it being a customer success story. We also manage the money that we put to our e-collections, in some cases from the same budgets that we purchase our print. So it's a constant balancing act of getting this right for our customers. Important to remember that our customers who take out e-books and e-audio books also borrow print. It's not one or the other, it's, bo it's both and it's a choice that we're offering. Um, our size and scale in this space gives us a lot of ability to advocate for our vendors, and in terms of overdrive, which is the uh, middle image you see on the slide there, um, we are their poster child for how to manage and curate e-collections. So when they're talking to other public library services around the world about how to do it, they point to Auckland Library's pages. What we can purchase in E is not in print, is not always available in E. So as I mentioned, this is about a balance. Publishers can pull e-content at any time. Um, and we have a very popular um, e-newspaper platform called Press Reader. Some of you may use it. A few years ago, Stuff and NZME changed the model by which Aucklanders could access their titles on that platform. So these things are not always in our control. So while we advocate, um, we can't always change the rules because those organisations have commercial models that they're working to. In terms of the content that we own ourselves and digitise and make available to Aucklanders, Kura Heritage Collections Online is the most significant one and one of the images is up there on your slides on the left. So in the time period that we're reporting on, we had 230,000 interactions on that platform. We have approximately 1.4 million records in that platform growing every day. And um, digitising the images is perhaps the easiest part of making the access um, available to Aucklanders. It's about the metadata and the description and the platform and everything else that goes on behind making that content available that is important. Every time we improve the access points, we see a bump upwards in the usage. This is unique content. It's also available via Google. So if you were looking for something in our, for instance, Sir George Grey collections, manuscripts, photos, letters, maps, archives, you don't need to come into our Auckland Library's website to access that. And that speaks a little to the change that in the way customers are using our services. 
They don't necessarily have to come into our world to get to it. You can do a search on Google right now and look for Sir George Grey letters and you'll find something pop up that takes you directly into Kura Heritage Collections online. The other element that's been really important to us are our social media channels. So not only um, social media for getting important operational messages out, but also for the content we create ourselves and we promote through our own channels. So that's podcasts um, and video content that we put up on SoundCloud and YouTube. And you can see there that those interactions are quite significant, nearly 390,000 in our reporting period, and they continue to grow. So this, this is work that we continue to do and we adjust weekly, looking at how people are using these services and we make adjustments accordingly. Happy to answer any questions about that. The world of E is quite complex, but you're speaking to a librarian, so I can go into detail if you want. Uh, a couple of very significant um, and transformational programs of work that we've been working on also for a number of years. Um, the first is automation of our collections management um, and introducing some artificial information intelligence into this process. So we started working on this project several years ago. In fact, the image you see on the screen there on the right is Tefeki, the octopus, our central sorter, which is the largest centralised library sorter in the southern hemisphere. This was implemented during the pandemic and during lockdowns, completely safely, I might add. Um, this was the beginning of a transformational project to automate the movement of our collections around Auckland. So on any one day in Auckland, we'll, we'll have between our 18,000 items moving around the city to meet customer demand. So what the intelligence part of the next stage of this project is going to do is make sure we get items into the right places. So basically increasing our return on investment in the books we have. To give you an example of that, we have um, what we call community language collections, which are very significant and important to Aucklanders. They are not languages that all are appropriate for all places in Auckland. So, for instance, in Mount Albert and Panmure, customers there want to use all six of the Indian language collections we have. Devonport Takapuna, not so much. So it's of little value in us having those books sitting in those places. So the intelligence part of the system lets us get items to the right places. The other benefits of this service is that it will significantly reduce the manual handling that our staff do in libraries, and it's going to ensure privacy requirements are met for patrons. The other significant program around efficiency and better service for customers is the Council Customer Services Integration, now live at 13 of our sites. This is about ensuring customers get a really good customer experience, and they basically can come to one of those facilities and do a range of activities they want to fulfil in one place. So it's a face-to-face -face channel incorporating many aspects of council services. There's an ongoing piece of work now to balance um, our workforce as a result of the impacts of these services to make sure we've got the balance right um, and in the right places. We're also paying particular attention to communities of greatest need as we think about balancing the workforce across our 56 libraries, but also all of the other facilities we manage. Sorry, Dale. Oh, no. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I just want to speak just to three of the, um, the items here about delivering through partnership. We mentioned earlier that a quarter of our programs and events are delivered by partners in our communities. Um, one is the, the top right there, Skinny Jump, in, in conjunction with the Digital Inclusion Alliance. So Skinny Jump is a low-cost prepaid broad, broadband service offered by um, Skinny, which is part of Spark. They, um, Spark don't have a distribution mechanism, so our libraries effectively act as a, uh, as a distribution and a place where people can come to get get skilled advice about, a, about how to use this broadband at home. Someone asked me during the week when I was sharing this um, whether um, it had much impact. So I, I can tell you that for the 3,818 homes and families that have got internet connection at home that they didn't have and couldn't afford before that have been assisted by our staff, that has a huge 
impact. You imagine having a family of young people trying to do homework these days, or if you're trying to access your, your banking, the ability to have low-cost internet at home when you can't afford it is, is significant. Uh, besties, so this is a, a, a reading initiative that Auckland Libraries developed in conjunction with some publishers in New Zealand. So this was last August and featured exclusively Auckland authors. And it catapulted several into the top 10, a top 20 most borrowed book list for the first time, knocking off our usual triumvirate of, uh, of Lee Child, Michael Connolly and David Baldashi. So, um, so that was a, a significant benefit, not just to our customers, but to emerging and established Auckland authors and even now, that's still um, a significant portion of that top 20 list. And then the other one is these, um, these results here. These are the very recent results of collaborations with communities and with the publishing ecosystem. These are um, largely children's books in, lang in Auckland's languages, Auckland's diverse languages that wouldn't normally be published because they're probably not normally commercially viable. But with Auckland Libraries acting as kind of the conductor of the orchestra, we've been able to create all this content that's now available in languages that are, um, that are used in the homes of a lot of Aucklanders and are now available in libraries, um, including, including a very important one about um, being ready in one of our Pacific languages, for, um, which was a co-production with Auckland Emergency Management all with uh, Auckland Council attribution on the, uh, on the cover. And then, um, so that's that for partnerships, which, and partnerships are nothing new for libraries. We've been doing partnerships for ages and, and we're doing more. So last slide. Um, I'm conscious of time, so there's plenty of information there, but perhaps the key one that I wanted to point out was in the, the six or the seven months actually to the end of January, the 80, almost 83,000 children, parents and caregivers attending our, um, our predominantly literacy related programs, early learning programs. The, that's equivalent to about 922 electric double decker buses parked, or not, actually not parked, they'd be driving along, wouldn't they? The, um, the Northern Busway. So um, you know, that's a lot of children and their, and their whanau coming in to progress their, their early literacy. Um, and literacy, we're, we're part of the literacy ecosystem. We don't own li literacy just because we're libraries, but we play a really important role along with schools and other organisations to make sure that we've got literate Aucklanders that can participate in society. So that's us, and we're, we're available for any questions you might have. Actually, I want questions. Uh, we've got a question from the previous one, from more Karuna's team, but thank you for the library promotion. Um, Ken Turner. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to everybody for their hard work, and I want to be constructive with this question, um, and my question will be, how do we dig deep? Thank you. Um, I asked to have those put up. You put up a picture of a statue that had been cleaned and put back. There's the before and there's the after. The after cost us $116,980. You know, that concrete slab there for $64,555 would only just quite cover the top of that camera stand. It's got two four-metre legs underneath it still reinforced. One is absolutely arguable by anybody unnecessary. So when I look at the figures you tell me, this is why I came here, this is why I was sent here by the public. When I look at the figures you tell me, I wonder how much we could do it cheaper. How do these reports dig deeper into the actual delivery costs in a way that we could analyze them better? Thank you. Um, Daryl, it's, yeah. I think we've had the library bits. If I was you, I'd run safely back to the, <laughs> to the Just, into your um, little nook and cranny and read a book, mate. Point of order, Chair. Um, point of order, has this information been emailed to the staff in advance? Because this is really not the subject of a governing body meeting. This is, this is management 
you know, political No, I think this is a very acceptable question. Uh, probably more in some ways that, that this is a decision-making body and uh, possibly the last uh, um, marketing exercise from the library was probably not really more suited here, but I think finding out these sorts of things well, is a this, very good question. Has this information been conveyed by the simple form of email requesting the staff? It, yes, it has, several times. Look, I, I'm gonna, this question up here, I'm ruling that we're going to listen to it, please. So, uh, look, I don't know the specifics of this particular project, uh, but I know we are asking questions and hoping to get uh, Taryn Crew and her operations manager online uh, with an answer for that. Um, uh, yes, I don't have the specific answer to that uh, question right now. No, look, I, I mean, I'm accepting of the, the point within the question. Um, I don't know the history with this. Um, I'd have to suspect that there is some visibility at a local board level with the project, but there's a presumption in that, and we're racing to get somebody who might be able to answer the question for you. If that can't happen right in this session, then uh, I promise we'll come back to you with um, some clarity, Councillor. Thank you. So my point is just challenging what we're talking about today. Thank you. Hey, drop it. All right, we're going to get an answer to that question to you and I'll be interested in what it was in myself. Uh, Cap uh, Councillor Watson's got another one. Yeah, this is for the, for the library team, um, for, for Daryl. Oh, it's here. Musical, James, musical, go on you guys, flee. Musical cheers. <coughs> He's behind you, uh, Councillor, so just one second. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so thanks for the presentation, Daryl, and, and in it you, you referred to the the, the increasing importance of the connection, identity and belonging our libraries are providing. And um, certainly from my perspective, in the context of the council withdrawing any other kind of civic function, so the, the ward I represent, you know, the, 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 the council businesses are hopped off. There is no real council presence there, other you know, for a population of 120,000 people. But there is a library, and, and what I would appreciate a little clarification on is the, the, the central important role that your library staff are now fulfilling in activities and interactions with members of the public that go way beyond um, just clientele, school groups, um, you know, elderly people, students, but, in, but increasingly people who, who are really disconnected from society. And what I would like to know is, uh, given that, you know, that incredibly important interface with, with the community, um, how staff are, are coping and, and what support they get and what provision is going forward for that role that is only going to increase, particularly in these areas where the, the council is cut and run. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Yes, there's, uh, there's no question that libraries play a really important role in, in the, right across society. And as I, as I mentioned, they're, the, they're really the last bastion of warm physical spaces where people can come and, uh, and be welcomed and not, not have to, to pay to enter. The, even, even before COVID, because of our welcoming and inclusive um, Way that we, the way that libraries operate, they've, they've always attracted a very wide range of people, and sometimes we, we have people that deal with mental health issues, which you might be referring to. And since since COVID, there's no question that, that um, our, our ability to help those people has become even more important. But that also brings some challenges with it as well. So we 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 continue to invest in um, staff training and capability around how to how to recognise. How to um, how to respond to and how to look after themselves in terms of um, working with with people that might be dealing with mental health issues. We've got pretty clear uh, processes about when we get involved. Uh, perhaps when we have to escalate that to um, police or, or other agencies. But at the same time, as uh, recognising that that yes our people perhaps are at more risk throughout their daily work than, than we are sitting here, that 
by, by their nature, people who work in libraries desperately want to help these people and are, are trained to help these people to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, and, and then of course, in, outside of libraries in the connected communities um, department, we have other parts, we have other units and teams that are working with um, a range of different people, including homeless people, um, etc. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Philly, please. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, team, for um, the report. I just wanted to pick up on some points you made um, around the library's work um, in that digital divide space um, in providing partnering with Spark and providing the skinny jump um, uh, internet connection. And I know that for my communities, it's been a real game changer. And that during COVID, we, we, we know that the digital divide became something that people were very, very aware of. So I really commend you for that work. I just wanted to ask for people who might be listening as well, is the program still going? Is that partnership still going? And if it is, how do people join? I know there's a big push out in my area, but uh, it may be available across the rest of Auckland. I'm not, I'm not sure. So it'd be good to have that detail. And then also, is there a cost to council itself? Um, and um, are you able to tell us, you know, maybe is there a benefit that, or what benefits have you seen? And is that able to be put into dollar amounts as well for us? Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Furley. And it's great to hear that it's, it's making a difference in your community. Um, it's, it's available right, right across Auckland, right across New Zealand, actually. But we, um, we're the main player when it comes to connecting people with this service and these modems in, in Auckland. It's ongoing. Um, there's no direct cost to council. Our people are going to be there helping people do things right throughout the, uh, all the things that happen in a library during a normal day and um, helping people connect with Skinny Jump is, is part of that. Um, so what was that, the, part, the last part of your question? Um, so if people do want to join, how do they do okay, that? Okay, that's right, yeah. So the Skinny Jump have some criteria for families to qualify um, to, to receive what is, what is very um, cheap internet at home. And so um, we, we work out in the community to, to let other agencies know that this is available. And, um, and so they often refer families to us. Um, of course, we, we have lots of connections ourselves with communities, so we, we, we're promoting it, and our staff are promoting it to, um, to Fano. Um, and then it's just a really a matter of sitting down with, um, with a family member and, and um, giving them the modem, explaining how to, how to connect it, um, working with them to understand um, how to get it working. And then, of course, once you've got the, the modem, if you haven't used, if you haven't got an email account before, or you've never used uh, a web browser, you've never used Google, which is often the case, uh, it's, it's our skilled staff that are helping people to understand and taking them through. This is how you set up an email account. You know, it's impossible to do just about anything without email. So this is how you set up an email account. This is, this is how you search for things. This is what a browser is. And, and that's, that's what we do. Kia ora, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one last one. I'm conscious of time before everyone asks long questions, please. Uh, that there's a bit of pressure on us hearing from the um, Eden Park body I'm going to bring forward next. They have some problem with someone leaving shortly, so please can you make your questions reasonably short and your answers also. Walker, please, Councillor Walker. Sure, so a fairly short question. Um, we've just got a, a long-term plan uh, pr uh, process underway. One of the locations that we promote uh, libraries for people to um, drop off the forms but it's come to my attention that you can only drop off the forms to a very limited number of libraries that happen to have a service centre function and that is not obvious to um, to people um, uh, so my my question is around what it would entail in terms of cost um, uh, and effort for libraries generally to be able to accept um, uh, forms. Uh, for example, in my community, you can drop one off to Ariwa, you can drop one off to Takapuna, you can't drop one off to Browns Bay, and the local service centres closed down, and, and this repeats around Auckland, and it makes it quite difficult for people. 
I'll give a short answer. Um, so I, I, I don't know what's written on the form in terms of where to drop those off, but there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of forms being given to our staff and us um, finding a way to get those from any library to where they need to go. And I'll, I'll pick up the more general issue with the engagement team, Councillor. Uh, my direct experience is that people have been turned away. Um, okay, thank you for that, Councillor Bartley, and then we're going to Eden Park. Okay, cool. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really wanted to know, like, I'm picking up on your presentation, you talked about how the Indian books are um, popular in some libraries, not in other libraries. Would you say that all our libraries have got uh, value in addressing the different needs of their own communities in their own ways? And also, are you satisfied with how we're getting the information of the full picture of what our libraries do around literacy, not just um, books taken out of a library, but everything a library does for literacy? And also, has there been an increase in the numbers to the programs that you're running Given the high cost of living and the financial struggles people are going, the library seems to be the only place where you can do free activities during the holidays. So, thank you. Okay, I'll try and keep that, that brief as well. Um, so, in terms of the programs, yes, we, um, we are probably one of the, the few places that families on lowish incomes can have children participate in something meaningful and useful and educational during a, a school holidays. And that will continue. Um, sorry, what was the first part? I was so focused on the end part of your question, Councillor. I missed the first part. Um, was it fair to say that all our libraries are meeting the needs oh, yes, of the yeah. different communities? So, and the, we all know that there's not just one Auckland, and we don't, and therefore we don't take a cookie cutter approach to the services and the, even the collections that we have in libraries. They are tailored based on our, our insights of communities from community snapshots. The, um, the intel that our staff have of their communities. So if you if you walk into uh, a, a library that's got a certain percentage of an ethnicity, for example, we will make sure that there's, lang there's languages that reflect that in the collection. We have staff that <coughs> understand the language and, cu and cultures of the different mix in, in different communities. And so yeah, I, I, there's always ways that we can improve, but we're, we're always refining and looking at communities and, uh, and seeing how we can best respond because what we're doing in Devonport Takapuna was, might be great for them, that might not be appropriate for Manarewa. But still very important for Devonport, very important for... Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So every library's got its value. Yeah. I, the way I describe it to our team is that there's some, there's some menu items that we have to offer everywhere. So like if you go to McDonald's around the world, you're always going to expect to see a Big Mac. But um, we, we, but I tell our, our teams that we, we, we've got to have some Big Macs. We've got to have internet access. We've got to have, um, you know, public computers. But it, all the all the different local board areas and libraries are, are really encouraged to use their own herbs and spices to come up with programs and responses and collections that um, that meet the needs of the community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that and for your presentation. I'm going to. Um move that we receive that and it's going to be seconded by Councillor Bartley. All those in favour please say aye. Thank, contrary, thank you very much. We're going to move to item 10 and I welcome uh, 